Welcome to Meekum Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. It's the show geared toward keeping you up to speed with the latest auto news, event coverage, and expert industry insight. Now, here are your hosts, Matt Avery and John Craman. Hey, and welcome everyone to another episode of On The Move. I'm Matt Avery, executive producer of The Transmission, and joining me is my co-host, John Craman. You know him as lead TV commentator for Mecham Auctions on NBCSN. Hey, John, and I welcome back for the 10th episode of On The Move. Yeah, that's interesting. 10, uh, 10 episodes it has gone by really fast. We've had some great guests, some great shows, and uh, boy, we've got a really nice schedule coming up uh, over the upcoming summer as well. So just a big shout out to everybody. Thanks for the support. And um, we look forward to continuing along uh, the uh, podcast path. Now, John, speaking of the summer schedule, we have a couple updates for listeners. What's the latest? Yeah, Harrisburg has been canceled. That was scheduled, of course, for July 29th through the August 1st. And that is, uh, they're just not ready to open up for us yet. And uh, the word from the consignment department, Frank Meekum himself, is is if you're a consigner for Harrisburg currently, uh, you are welcome to join us. Uh, Just take that consignment, roll it over for either Indianapolis coming up in mid-July or for the all-new summer special. That would be Meekum Kissimmee, Florida, August 27th through the 29th. While that has been canceled, we are full steam ahead with the Davenport auction happening next week. Yep, sure are. Talked to uh, Paul over at the tractor division uh, within the past couple of days, and he said it is really going great. Lots of bidders signing up. They're still getting more tractor consignments. So that is going to be June 17th through the 20th, and that sounds like, Matt, it's going to be bigger than ever. So we're going to be paying some attention to that, and we'll be reporting on uh, how, how that one goes. Now, John, speaking of reporting, there's some car news that you and I are both excited about, starting with, I know it's something you're really excited about, this news of a Porsche Targa. Yeah, there you've got a uh, Heritage Edition coming out, Matt, that is pretty slick. Uh, unfortunately, it's expensive. It looks like it'll have a base price in the $180,000 range. Will be available with a conventional three-pedal manual transmission. It's a seven-speed, and it will be powered by their 443-horsepower twin-turbo, three-liter flat air-cooled six. Definitely a nod to uh, Porsche's very historic past. Uh, we first saw the Targa hit production in 1967. So this is kind of a nod to the past. They've had the Targa the past couple of years but what they've done with this one is is they've added this heritage edition it has really got a great look to it 993 to be produced so get them while they're hot (laughs) Uh, and now uh, it seems like a common uh, theme John of sedans being phased out and we've got news of another one with GM possibly announcing that Malibu is now going to be phased out yeah no official word yet from General Motors but uh, lots of rumors flying around that it could be within the next couple of years that the sole remaining American branded mid-size sedan. If we go back, oh, let's say around 2015, that was one of the hottest segments on the market. And it's just funny how the market has changed so fast. So when we hear more about a possible uh, total end date, of course, we'll report on that. But for right now, if you're interested in American branded mid-size sedan, uh, the Malibu is still available and it's a great car, but uh, it looks like that one's going to be going by the wayside as well. Now, what continues to remain hot, John, are pickup trucks, and I'm really excited about a new version coming out by the crew over at SVE, formerly of S- SLP, but they're the uh, they're the ones responsible for these really cool modern Yanko Camaros that are coming out, but they are doing another round of Cyclone pickup trucks. So they started this year for model year 2020 based on the GMC Canyon pickup truck. Uh, again, the 2020 version came out with two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive with a V6 that had a supercharger. 50 were made and they produced 455 horsepower and 400 foot-pounds of torque really exciting truck they the company has announced that now they are doing a 2021 version and they are claiming 750 horsepower with all-wheel drive so the rumor is is it going to be a v8 swap uh surely you can't get that from a v6 but who knows yeah, that's cool. You know, the heritage of that Cyclone name goes back to 1991 and 1992 when really a landmark vehicle was introduced by GMC in their pickup truck. It was a it was a turbocharged V6, 4.3 liter, 280 horsepower with all-wheel drive that was one of the fastest production vehicles in that time period. Impressive specs even by today's standards, 0 to 64.3 seconds, uh, low 13-second quarter mile times. I had a companion vehicle called the Typhoon that was the SUV. So uh, I guess not surprised that 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 your folks are going with the uh that heritage name again a lot like porsche we talked about earlier kind of tapping into the glory of the past 
probably see some good sales on those. Now, John, those, uh, the, the originals, are we seeing those at auction? I mean, it seems like those are really heading their stride with collectability. Yeah, they are. We've, uh, we, we, we don't see a lot of them, maybe three or four of them a year, but they always get a lot of attention. And of course, uh, what buyers really like in that segment are those trucks that are, that are original or uh, unmodified condition. And if you've got one, uh, you better bring uh, about a $20,000 uh, check with you to consider picking one of those up. Now, John, looking ahead to the rest of the show, do you want to tell listeners who uh, we have coming on? Yeah, really glad to have a couple of names most people be familiar with. Ray Evernham, uh NASCAR Hall of Fame member, uh, well known as a race driver and uh, television personality, and maybe the best for Jeff Gordon's crew chief during the glory years of the Rainbow Warriors. And then we'll have Stephen Cox, my compadre on the Mecham Auctions television show, also quite a racer in his own renown, and we'll be getting into things uh, with Stephen in regards to kind of his background that we don't normally hear about on the show. Yeah, John, really looking forward to some great discussion. A final note, there is a brand new digital copy of the Mika Monthly magazine available. It's definitely worth checking out. And John, if I'm not mistaken, your column was looking at Peter Brock. Is that right? Yeah, I'm such a fan of Peter Brock, a living legend by any standard. Uh, Check out a really great little story. homage honoring Peter Brock and his career and uh, it will it will probably make you I'll kind of give the punchline away it'll probably make you want to go out and pick up a couple of his books so now you kind of beat me I had my column uh, at the red line that I do you've actually got two stories that you have contributed to the Mika Monthly. What did you write about? What do we have to look forward to? I spotlighted a special 2002 anniversary edition Trans Am sold by Carl Black Pontiac and modified by the GMMG Performance Shop. Uh, In addition to that, I also put together a feature about the On The Move podcast, and it'll give readers a little bit more information about how the podcast came about, some of the fun we've had so far, and what's in store down the road. Mika Auctions is proud to bring you On The Move with Matt Avery and John Craman. For more on the world of collector cars, head over to Meekum.com. Now let's get back to the show. On the phone this segment, we've got Ray Evernham. I'm just going to run down just a few uh, of Ray's accomplishments. NASCAR Hall of Fame member. I uh, was a class of 2018. He was a crew chief for Jeff Gordon. They won 47 races together, three cup championships. I think that was 95, 97, and 98. In 2000, Ray created Evernham Motorsports, running Dodges. Saw him in NASCAR, ARCA, USAC, some other series as well. First lover, Modifieds. Man, we see Ray on TV all the time. He's got an amazing car collection. Ray, thank you so much for joining us today. When did the racing bug first bite? Oh, well, thank you, John and Matt. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, it, it's not very difficult to get me to talk about cars, so I, I appreciate the invite. Um, gosh, uh, you know, I, people ask me that, and, and I will tell you that I, I must have been bitten, and my mom must have been bitten in the womb, because I honestly don't remember. I have zero memories of ever wanting to do anything else. Uh, as I was a kid, you know, go-karts and things around the yard, I just, I, I wore just a big old dirt track right in my, my parents' yard, just driving it around. And, you know, while my dad was an incredible athlete, he played semi-pro football and baseball, just an incredible athlete, but I just never really got into the stick and ball sports that much. Uh, I just started going to dirt tracks and things with, with my uncle when I was seven or eight years old and just honestly uh, I, I, there's just something about the something about when I see something with wheels on it, I get excited. <laughs> Ray, when you started to get into competition, when you moved up from go karts, what were some of the first cars that you started to uh, race? My very first race car was a 1962 Chevy Nova that was an old dirt car that we bought for 400 bucks. They started a six cylinder class at the local pave track uh, in Belmar, New Jersey. I'm from the Jersey Shore, and. Uh, called modern stocks. So we, uh, we bought a motor out of the junkyard for 20 bucks. We flat towed this car to wall stadium. Um, when, when you used to take a piece of a drive shaft and a chain, that was our tow bar. And we pulled into the, uh, track, uh, not knowing anything about racing or anything. And they said, you know, this is a paved track and that has dirt tires on it. And, and, and I said, well, that's all we got. Can, can we race it? So, uh, so that was my very first, uh, entry into uh, racing, getting done, you know, because I didn't really race the go karts, just drove them around the yard, but just uh, went and took all, pulled uh, whatever money I had from working at the local Texaco station 
and, and bought that car and just took it to the racetrack and started racing it. Ray, let's fast forward now as crew chief for Jeff Gordon. What are some of your special memories about that uh, very magical relationship? Well, you know, when you say magical, John, you know, that it really was, uh, you know, not often in your life do you get to work with a, a group of people like I was fortunate enough to work with at Hendrick Motorsports and, and on the, that Rainbow Warrior number 2014. You know, Jeff Gordon and I still to this day have a great relationship. He, he's like my little brother. Um, we, we speak quite a, a bit. We still do some fun things t- together. Uh, and he, he was an amazingly, amazingly talented person. So, I mean, that, that goes without saying. But the rest of that team, you know, they were incredible um separately, but put them together, you know, they were truly a team that, that really did punch above its weight. You know, the whole was greater than some of the parts. And, uh, you know, I look back at that and we, we won a lot of races together and we did, you know, set a lot of records and did some things that actually changed the sport, the way that cars were built or the way the races were called and, and, and whatnot. But I, I just looking back with, and being able to work with those people, uh, and the, the bond that we had for that seven years or so, to me, it is much more than any race that we may have won. And, you know, there were some special memories, obviously, winning the first Brickyard and winning our first, uh, the Coke 600, and we won the Southern 500, uh, uh, I think, four times in a row. But still, you know, watching what those guys did, because when we started that team in 19, late 1992, there were only two or three guys with, uh, that had ever worked on a NASCAR stock car. Tell us about your car collection, Ray. Uh, over time, you've put together, I've been there and I've seen it, what, what a lot of us in the car enthusiast world feel is one of, the, one of the best collections that they've ever seen. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. You know, uh, you know, as I said, you and I have become friends throughout the years uh, because because of our love of cars. And as you know, my I always tell everybody, look, my car collection is a lot like me. It's it's all over the place. It's very eclectic. It, you know, I I have um, some vintage race cars. As I said, I've got uh, one of Dan Gurney's uh, cars, a '69 Eagle, the Bronner Hawk, the '65 Bronner Hawk, and then I've got an AJ Foyt car that's a later March, uh, uh, you know, an '84. I've got a Holman Moody. Um, uh, Torino that David Pearson drove, and I've kept uh, I've kept a couple of the Dodges that Bill Elliott and I raced together, and one of the rookie cars that they actually built for Jeff Gordon. So from the race car side, I've got you know uh, old Indy cars and midgets and dragsters, and and then from you know again from the other other side of of things, um, uh, some Chrysler wing cars that uh, had a Dodge Daytona. Um, right now, uh, we're actually restoring a, a, a pretty significant Dodge Daytona that, that we can talk about. But um, a lot of my cars, some of them are, are not worth that much money, but they all have a story. Uh, and, you know, again, some of, them, some of them are worth more. But when I find something with a story, it's very important to me, and it's important to save it and tell that, that story. And, you know, we, we've got a little car called a Woody Lee T that's out of California, and it, it's a car that Jack Hagerman, the great, you know, body builder from sports cars and, and Indy cars, did the body on this thing. But, you know, it, it has history at uh, the Grand National Roadster Show. It has history at El Mirage. It has history at Bonneville. It's just a little flathead powered car. So, you know, when we go out to get something, it, it, it's really about the story that's attached to it. And I've got some drivers. So I've got a 65 Malibu SS that we, we built uh, here. Um, I wanted a, a version of my high school car, but then I realized my high school car had drum brakes and uh, no air conditioning or power steering and things like that. So we, we upgraded a good bit. Uh, we do a lot of work with the guys from Detroit Speed here. So we, we uh, work with them on suspension of, uh, of that car. And then I've got a little Porsche GT4 that, that I, I, I really like. And, you know, 30 years ago, if you'd have said, Ray, you're going to have a Porsche. I'd have said, no way, man. Where the, well, I'm not going to get one of those cars. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place with the collection, which what, what happens then is people say, what's your favorite car? And you say, look, it's really hard to pick my favorite car or I wouldn't have to have so many. So I think we're right about a hundred cars now and trying to reduce that down. Um, and as you know, the, uh, the, uh, probably the crown jewel of my personal, my, the, the car that I'm in love with the most is, uh, I have the 1958 Chevrolet from the movie American Graffiti, uh, which is a car that I fell in love with when I was about 15 and, uh, and, and waited about uh, 42 years to get it.
Hey, you've piqued our interest. Uh, Dodge Daytona restoration project. Give us some details on that one. Really cool project. Partnered up with a, a friend in Michigan who's had the car for 26 years, but it is the car, the Chrysler, uh, what we call DC 93. That uh, the Chrysler engineers did all of the development work for the Dodge Daytona stock car, and this is the car that broke the 200 mile per hour average lap average barrier with Buddy Baker in, in March of 1970. And uh, it was the first car to go 200 miles per hour on a closed course, you know, fat more ahead of Indy cars, uh, sports cars, all those things. And uh, um, Greg Kwiatkowski, who, who was my partner on the project, has spent 27 years, I think, gathering parts and information and notes and documentation. And we've been going through a painstaking uh, rebuild on this car with many of the original parts. You know, we've, we've got the original nose from the firewall forward. We've got one of the original engines that were in the car, or transmissions, gears, and, and he, uh, he, gathered these parts right down, you know, pictures to the spacing of the pop rivets. So right now it's, um, it's being assembled. So we hope to debut that car, uh, in another month or so. Ray, you had some recent excitement with showings at both Pikes Peak and Pebble Beach. Tell us about that experience. You know, when, again, I tell people I'm, I'm like the Forrest Gump of motorsports. I, I tell people I get in all these incredible situations because of because of cars, you know, with the things that we've been able to do and some of the people that we've been able to meet um, because of the, my NASCAR career. And then there were two things that, you know, actually there's there was uh, four things that I wanted to do and I've been able to do three of them on that bucket list, you know, racers, you know, your Pikes Peak and as a sh- you want to go to Pebble Beach, want to go to Baja and want to go to Le Mans. And right now, um, you know, we haven't gone to Le Mans, so that's, that's what's next on our bucket list. But we decided that we were going to build this car and do a bunch of crazy things with it. And it's a 1936 Chevrolet sedan. It's called a ghost. Um, and it is, it's really, uh, it's, you know, it's got a an all aluminum, a 410 cubic inch big block Chevrolet or small block Chevrolet in it, and it makes about 840 horsepower, but it also makes 3,000 pounds of downforce for a 36 uh, Chevy. And Alan Sir Jr. was supposed to run the thing to Pikes Peak for me because I wanted to compete at Pikes Peak. And Al couldn't because of a conflict. So I said, well, fine, I'll go do it myself. And uh, we went up there as, as, as rookies and, and ended up winning the uh, experimental class uh, as a rookie, uh, set a 10-minute to 11-second time going up the mountain and won that. And that was in June. And then we got invited to bring our Bronner Hawk, our 1965 Mario Andretti Bronner Hawk, to Pebble Beach and we were just elated to have been invited and, and attend that. And we went there and, uh, and won best in class with that. And I always tell everybody, you know, you, you hope to go to Pikes Peak and Pebble Beach in a lifetime. We end up doing them two months apart and come home with a trophy from, from each place. And when you spend your life doing stock cars and, and open wheel cars, sprint cars and things like that, you just never think that uh, you could go to a place like that and, and even compete. So we've been, uh, been very fortunate to um, to do a lot of extra things past my NASCAR career. Ray, you are staying so busy in all kinds of different automotive stuff. What other car projects are you currently working on? I talked to Bruce Canepa this morning, and he called at 9.30 um, our time on the East Coast, so I know it was 6.30 on his his time, and, and he's like, hey, you know, we, we our car guys never sleep. So, so you just stay busy. And we're I'm working on a car right now with our guys. That I, I think it's... It's a really cool little car and way outside of, of, uh, of our world. It's an old H modified. It's called the ferret and it was built by a man named Peter Dawson in the late fifties. And it was the, the pieces that they used were, uh, from a Seata. And, and as, as you know, the Seatas have, have, have really gone crazy in price now, but this, this car, uh, is a hand built aluminum and magnesium car on a little tube frame, had a Crossley motor in it, and we're working to get it restored, hopefully to bring it to the Amelia Island Concours next year. But when I look back at, at, at some of the vintage um, sports racing and, and uh, the, the, these Italian cars that these craftsmen would make, you know, the bodies and, and whatnot on it, it just amazes me. Uh, 
how they did that back in the forties and, and fifties. So if you, if you look it up, it's just, you know, it's called the ferret by Peter Dawson. He, there was two of them. Um, one of them was a mid engine car that was made a little bit out of fiberglass. This one is, uh, as I said, it's, it's all aluminum and magnesium hand built, a uh, little H modified, but it's got some great stories. Pete Dawson was not only a Chrysler engineer, but he worked for Colin Chapman for a, a while with the Lotus program. And he also was, uh, the guy that worked on the golden rock with the Summers brothers, uh, at, at Bonneville and then went on to, uh, to build, uh, with Chrysler, um, a, a, a kind of a big GT, almost a, uh, I guess it'd be GT one or so at, at that time, uh, 64, 65 Plymouth. So a lot of history there with him, a lot of story with this car. Ray, I mentioned earlier, I see you on TV all the time on a variety of different shows, you know, guests having your own shows. What, uh, where can we see you on television coming up here this year? Uh, not a lot going on with the TV stuff, um, John. I mean, I, unless Mika wants to hire me to come in there and, and, uh, and help you guys, but <laughs> you're on the short list. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, but it, it, uh, you know, we were going to do Glory Road, um, a, a third season of Glory Road, but obviously with what's happened with the COVID-19 crisis and whatnot, we couldn't go out and do a lot of traveling and, and interviewing people. So that's been put on hold. Um, we are working, uh, Mr. Hendrick and I are working on bringing back all of our rights for Americana. So um, soon we will be announcing where we're going to place that on the network. Uh, we've got a couple of things in the uh, in the hopper because with me, I really want to get back out and telling the story. Um, you know, I don't like scripted television and we don't like a lot of drama, but as I said, the, the, the story of being able to tell the car and the fascinating people that you meet, like we did in Americana or that we've done on glory road, we certainly want to continue doing that. Just don't have anything nailed down yet. Well, it sounds good, Ray. Uh, we thank you so much for stopping by and giving us the download, and uh, we certainly look forward to connecting again soon. Thanks so much, Ray. Well, great. As I said, guys, it's not, it's not hard to get me to talk about cars, so call me anytime. Don't adjust that dial. On the Move, we'll be right back. Our program is proudly presented by Meekum Auctions, the world's largest collector car auctions. Now back to Matt and John. Well, our next guest is a auto racer, a motorcycle rider. He has his own TV production company, and he's an aspiring guitar player. Uh, Stephen Cox, thanks so much for stopping by. Oh, thank you. Leave the guitar part out because John's heard me play. <laughs> no, you're actually getting some pretty good chops there. Hey, Stephen, I just got to tell you, man, you and I go back a long way. My first recollection of you goes back to, and I'm a- interested to hear your your comments on this, go back to early 2008, where I think we were both uh, summoned to appear at Terry Lingner's production studio in Indianapolis to do a little play acting, uh, re- rehearsing, so to speak, for an upcoming, not yet aired television show, uh, covering Meekum Auctions, and it was you and I that were the very first that hunkered in in uh, Terry's booth. Do you remember those days? You know, I had completely forgotten about actually going downtown. It was uh, on North Meridian Street, for those of you familiar with the Indianapolis area, and the old Lingner Group Studios were there in like the, I don't know, the eight or 900 block, and uh, so we went upstairs and uh, met Terry. Terry introduced us. Uh, Terry Lingner is a longtime producer for uh, ESPN, for NBC, for a bunch of the major networks, and uh, then uh, he, he ran, he put us in a studio, and it, it seemed to me like they had like silent footage of just some random auction and a bunch of cars somewhere and you and I basically did a screen test yep we did and that's exactly what it was and it started with you and I as the very first two of all the announcers to be chosen and in March of 2008 it was you and I uh, uh, that launched off and kicked off what is now in season 13 did you think that your involvement would make them you've been a long time uh, television personality on a variety of shows we'll get to that here in a moment but did you ever think that we'd have such legs where 13 years later we were still going strong you know i never did jk because every television show has a life and that lifespan has has an expiration date on it and it's every show no matter what the case is it always has a lifespan and most of them honestly if you can get on a good major network television broadcast and get a five-year run that's really good and here we are in year 13 so so no i have to say i i, I honestly didn't expect it okay you have uh, made a lifetime career of your enthusiasm and success and talent in auto racing 
and in television. Let's start right now. Let's switch gears a bit. Let's go over to uh, racing. How did you get involved in racing and kind of just bring us on sort of a path to where you're at today? Well, I, um, I I played every sport that there was when I was in school, and uh, then you know my my primary sport was basketball because hey, I'm a native Hoosier. And over time, it occurred to me, you know what? There's going to be uh, there's going to be an end date on on my basketball career. And I always grew up going down to a dirt track called Paragon Speedway in Southern Indiana every single Saturday night with my dad. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a professional athlete, it's not going to be in the NBA, huh? <laughs> you know, I just, I'm, I don't have the athletic body for that. This is not going to happen. I need a plan B. And I already loved auto racing, and so I thought we'll give it a shot. And I always figured that maybe it would just be kind of a, uh, a hobby. I didn't know if it would turn into a full-time vocation or – and eventually – I, I figured, okay, if I'm if I'm going to go anywhere in auto racing, I have to move from dirt to asphalt. So I went to asphalt. Then I, uh, you know, f- figured, okay, I've got to figure out how to drive road courses. And so I went out to um, Hallett Motor Racing Circuit in Oklahoma, and a guy offered me a ride in a uh, uh, one of the. You guys remember the old Datsun Z cars? He, he he gave me a ride in a Datsun Z car that was uh, completely race prepared, totally stripped down, and we went out the very first day and won a race. And I'd never been on the <laughs> on a road course before and I thought maybe this is something I should consider <laughs> and so uh, I've been road course racing and stock car racing ever since and the reason why is because it is really really difficult to make money in road racing even at the very highest levels of the sport it's difficult most of the so-called professionals they were independently funded and sometimes independently wealthy and they actually brought part of their living to the ride to make it happen so you can call them professional all day but they don't make their mortgage off that um, but in oval racing even on the short ovals like uh, like JK you've got a, a background in uh, uh, the uh, Illinois and Wisconsin area of driving you can there are some classes where you can make some money in uh, uh, Hooters Pro Cup racing and other various types of stock cars. And so I've been mixing the two ever since and uh, still driving to this day and enjoying it very much. How do you meld and mesh that into uh, your television background and also your television production experience? Well, the funny thing is uh, I was a racing driver long before I ever got into television. And the reason that actually it was Terry Linger, the same gentleman that we spoke of a few minutes ago, who called me up in 1995 because uh, I was driving go-karts at the time, just trying, and, and I had already been in full-size automobiles, but I stepped down to go-karts on purpose so that I would have an easy entry-level starting ground to teach myself road course racing instead of just ovals. So then I get a call from uh, Terry Langer, and he says, listen, uh, we need uh, some help uh, with um, a color commentator on a uh, broadcast called ESPN Saturday Night Lightning back in 1994-1995. And so I thought, yeah, sure, I mean, I'll take that. Uh, If I'm not driving, I can be announcing. And uh, at that point... Then I got calls from various other series. Then I spent nine years with the Hooters Pro Cup series on uh, Speed Vision and what became Speed Channel. And at that point in time, I started getting uh, some occasional ride offers in um, uh, ARCA, in uh, uh, the Hooters Pro Cup series itself. And so then my driving career kind of jumped up along the side, and they just kind of paralleled each other all the way to the level that I'm at right now. And it was never kind of really expected. It just sort of worked out that way. Stephen, when you're not in front of or behind the camera producing, I know you spend some time with a uh, Fox Body Mustang. What's the latest with that project? It's a 1980 Mustang, and it's uh, it's a member of the family. I dated my wife in that car, so it's not going anywhere. I got it when I was a senior in high school, and it had the, man, I think it was an 88 horsepower in line four-cylinder, 2.3-liter Ford. Ran just fine, but it didn't have uh, 88 horsepower. <laughs> it had absolutely nothing. And so uh, we uh, went out to McGonagall Engine Performance in uh, Muncie, Indiana, and I told him, hey, I need some horsepower. And uh, Dwayne sat down with me, and uh, he said, uh, okay, Stephen, what would you like? Maybe 600, 700 horsepower? <laughs> and I, I started laughing. I said, Dwayne, once I hit Mach 7, what am I going to do with the extra 300 horses? You know, Give me something that starts with a 4 that runs off pump gas and let's go back with a uh, Tremec 5 speed transmission so 
Mustang. Right now, we've got a, a five liter because it was very important to me. This is a Fox body Mustang. I wanted to stay within the lineage. You know, I didn't. Uh, LS engines are great, but it doesn't belong in a Mustang. I didn't want uh, something uh, completely wildly out of character. I wanted to keep it true blue Mustang. So we stayed with the five liter, uh, and we uh, punched it out to 347 cubes. So it's a little bit bigger now. Uh, 407 horsepower, 444 pound feet of, of torque, and uh, Tremec transmission. Then uh, we went out to um, some friends at uh, Late Model Restoration, and they gave me these chrome pony wheels that were so popular with the late Fox bodies, and they just look fantastic on the car. Uh, we're not finished with it yet. Now the, the interior and the suspension are next, but uh, it's a fun car to drive, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Other than uh, you and I and Katie and Bill and Scott getting together to do Meekum, uh, in July at Indianapolis, what else have you got going on and anybody that you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, I'd like to give a big shout out to everybody at Rally North America. They uh, have a rally that uh, uh, Tony Entrieri and Scott Spielman and, and the guys that are in charge of that uh, hired my company, Sop with Motorsports Television Productions, to put them on TV. And uh, they have a really nice show that runs for six episodes that repeat every year, and it's Rally North America. And it is it's just a traditional old fashioned road rally where everybody's timed and of course if you get a now here's the trick guys if you get a speeding ticket you're out because it's held on public roads so you're automatically disqualified if you get a speeding ticket so it's all about navigation and you go from one great historic site to another and they basically just plan a week long vacation for you and so rally north america is a production job that we've had for a few years you can watch it on mav tv uh, it's just a barrel of fun and then of course um in addition to that, we have uh, Meekum Auctions on NBC Sports Network that I'm happy to be a part of, and then I have my racing schedule. And between those three things, that's that's pretty much every weekend a uh, nonstop from March to November. So finally, Stephen, what have you got uh, race-wise? What have you got coming up uh, for the racing schedule, and who is on board to help you out this year with that? Well, this is, I'm really looking forward to this year. Uh, we have two big, big events that, in fact, you guys know the people that I'm involved with. This is my sponsor this year is 104 Plus Performance. Now, 104 Plus Performance is an incredible octane and horsepower booster that you just add to the fuel of your car. And I can personally vouch for it because I used it in my race cars long before I ever had a relationship with the company. And the reason I have a relationship with the company is because it's owned by the same parent company that is Stable Brand Fuel Stabilizer, which I talk about and advertise for, and we all do on every Meekum show. And they're great friends of ours and have been for a long time. So, um, Lo and behold, uh, we're going road racing uh, in uh, August 14 through 16 at a grid life event at Pikes Peak International Raceway in Colorado Springs. And grid life sort of mixes a giant music festival with a giant car show with all different forms of racing. And 104 Plus Performance really saw a great market there. They're involved with Grid Life, so that one's coming up in mid-August. And then we go back to Gingerman Raceway on October 1st through 4th. There's another Grid Life event there. And I'm really excited to be back with uh, Matt Peterson and Braunschweig Racing because that is the same team that we went to uh, with in uh, Gingerman Raceway in Michigan in 2015 and set the track record there, which still stands. So I get to go back with some of my favorite people in one of my favorite cars to one of my very favorite racetracks, and uh, that's October 1st through 4th at Gingerman Raceway in uh, Michigan. So I'm thankful to be on board with 104 Plus Performance, and they're guys that you already know. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for stopping by and giving us some updates on what's going on in your life. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing you again real soon at the upcoming Indianapolis auction. Well, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Stephen. We will see you in July. You've been listening to Meekin Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. For more information, visit Meekin.com. And join us again next time as we take you inside the world of muscle and collector cars and more.